Are you familiar with the twin study? Yes. Yes, of yes. course you are. Yes. I'm preaching to the choir here. Yes. Yeah. So do you want to explain the twin study a little bit? Um, I thought it was really interesting. So I'll start and then you can just take over and tell me where I'm wrong and things like that. But the twin study was basically NASA took uh, two twins, two astronaut twins, sent one into space uh, for an extended space travel. Mm-hmm. The other one stayed, uh, stayed on Scott Earth. Scott and Eric Kelly. Right. Scott, yes. and, St- Scott and, and Eric Kelly. Eric, Eric. Yes. I mean, I know Scott mostly. Right. It's twin that stays on Earth. <laughs> we apologize, Mr. Kelly. Um, but And then they did a bunch of these different measures to be able to assess um, the effect of long-term space travel yes. on these astronauts, right? And then one of them was cognition, right? So mm-hmm. they tested the um, astronaut's cognition and then um, the astronaut on Earth's cognition and the astronaut in space cognition, yes. right? And also tested it when he got back. Yes, yes. And then... Um, you can talk about some of the, the results of that. And then also the really interesting and cool part was uh, the telomeres to yes. me, right? Yes, so yes. telomeres are the caps of the chromosome, kind of like a jump rope, right? Yeah. Where you actually hold the yeah. jump rope, the chromosome is the jump rope. Yeah. And then what you're holding is the actual telomere. So the telomere sort of protects from injury, right, to the actual chromosome itself because you don't want your chromosomes to get injured, yeah. right, because that is really bad. And then um, they found that those telomeres were shortened, Yes. Right? After he came back yes. from space, they recovered they afterwards. Recovered. After yes. after a few months on back on Earth, right? But you know, I don't think he didn't go above lower orbit, right? No, he went. No, right. Yeah, he stayed in he's, lower he's, orbit. He stayed in the right? ISS. Right. Yes. So that is in the context of not even being exposed to this to radiation, deep space no. radiation. Yes. Like, what what's going to happen to the chromosomes if you go to deep space? For 18 months. Yes. How long did he go for? I forget. He went uh, for over one year. It was the one. It was the American one that stayed in space the longest. Right. And remember, he um, drank over 730 liter of his own recycled urine and uh, sweat. <sighs> Talk about uh, what you sacrifice can sacrifice uh, for your country. Well, and for humanity. This brings actually one point that we didn't touch: uh, how much. Uh, space uh, um, uh, research actually benefits Earth. There are ex- right. many, many examples. Like uh, you know, there are people that may think, well, why, why, why we have to invest uh, on uh, on space when there are many things to fix your own medical system, right? right? right. And we have learned so many things uh, right. that are applied uh, in uh, in Earth, yeah. and is that's one one of the reason why we want to learn from the space right. to really apply better diagnosis and better medicine yeah. here. I think like telemedicine uh, that we have. That you probably know better than I know, anyone. I know and, too much about it. Yeah. Right, but but telemedicine was there uh, developed already very well for for space travel because oh, right. the, yeah they yeah, have right. to do the telemedicine yeah. right yeah um, or uh, I mean there are many other many other things that we maybe another that you may you may not know but the imaging analysis that you use uh, for uh, MRI and mm-hmm. uh, PET scan uh, and uh, they've been developed to um, the digital analysis for the moon images to to really uh, clear out the moon images oh. all those systems have, have been used are used uh, routinely on MRI for and, uh, MRI imaging yes yes wow. so we have learned that so and we yeah. still want to learn so much yeah. um, um, but let's let's just go back to the twin study because i want to yes. make sure we hit it what happened with the cognition of this astronaut that didn't go into deep space stayed in lower orbit what what you know? What were the results? I of don't that? think there were many much dr- dr- drastic difference no, at all. No, there wasn't. No, not at no, all. No. Yeah. Do, so do you think that that study is kind of like, all right? Well, he didn't go into deep space, so it's not really applicable to what would actually Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Yes. Really. Yes, yeah. That that again. Is once that, you think about the ISS astronauts, you have to consider what you are measuring. There is the stressors of microgravity right. and the sleep disturbances as well, because mm-hmm. you know they don't have like uh, the day and light uh, as good as we have. Right. And so sleep disturbance and uh, and uh, absence of gravity and what does that do? To cognitive function, right. so I think actually it's very relevant because we see that th- at least those they don't have a significant effect uh, right. on cognitive function. Now right. we have to add in though, the radiation, is, the radiation experiment. Mm. What does the radiation do if you start to combine with those other stressors? Got it. Okay. But I, I think what was more exciting to me about the twin studies, and then we stopped, but yeah. do you remember the, the picture when, uh, when uh, they, they took that one of them was shorter than the other? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And p- because when you are in absence of gravity, you, you, you right. get... And immediately, like, I think it took him two days to get uh, back to normal because of gravity. Do you remember how much he grew by? 
Uh, I remember the picture. It was a f- couple of inches. Yeah, I think it, it might was two, more. two to three inches, yeah, I think. Yeah. I yeah. remember very well the, the yeah. picture. It's pretty, it's, it's funny. That was great. Yeah. That was awesome. But that tells you also to your body, right? It's like it's so much pressure right. and it's like so much. Yeah. So um, we talked about uh, certainly the effects of radiation, right? Yes. Especially on the brain in, in the context of deep space travel. But we've talked about microgravity too. Yes. Right? And the effects of microgravity potentially that can yeah. have on the brain. Yeah. Um, let's extrapolate on that a little bit. Would you mind describing what microgravity is? Because I don't think a lot of people really know. Right, right, right. Okay, so microgravity is really the absence of gravity. While we mm. are in the Earth, right, we're pulled down. Mm. We don't float everywhere because we are pulled down by the, the, the by the Earth, right? Mm-hmm. And so we walk and we don't uh, fly anywhere. But uh, as you get uh, out of the terrestrial orbits actually and even in the moon i mean everybody can remember seeing those videos of the astronauts that they were like yeah, 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 yeah. they float a uh-huh. little bit so um uh there is less gravity there right. for sure and so they have to float once you are in space there is no gravity at all so you see you all have seen the astronauts right. like that, that, that they float yeah. everywhere but what that's what that results on is all a lot of fluid shift, right? Mm-hmm. Fluid shift that cause pressures to the brain, mm-hmm. particularly the first uh, uh, to to be affected there is really the visual f- system, mm. uh, because there is uh, the, the the pressure is now shifted uh, on the on the eyes actually. Right. So, th- and what you're saying is uh, a subjective uh, complaint from a lot of astronauts is a loss. A loss or a decrease of visual acuity, uh, right, with uh, space travel yeah, yeah, or that's, just being in space. That's, yes, yeah, that's the the, the vision is uh, becoming uh, it's, uh, it becomes severely more affected. Which is important because you don't want your astronaut to be blind when he's tr- when he needs to be yes. doing yeah. work in on yeah. Mars, right? Yeah. So, but then uh, the absence of gravity also affect uh, um, your skeleton. Mm-hmm. And uh, it cause a uh, uh, loss of uh, bone density mm-hmm. up to one percent uh, a month. Yeah. So if you were to think about those three years mission, uh, and if you add up one percent a month of uh, of l- bone loss, mm-hmm. you're arriving in Mars, and you really are severely deficient on on bone mass, right. bone density. Right. And so you have to rebuild some of that. Right. But also the the gravity on Mars is far less than in the in the Earth. Right. And so it would be another big challenge. Right. Another effect of absence of gravity is muscle uh, loss of muscle. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, um, to uh, to counteract these astronauts, they, they have to exercise also in the ISS mm-hmm. at least three to four hours a day. Right. To maintain their muscle, otherwise the muscle is going to be gone. Because imagine yourself, you're floating right. all the time, right? right? You don't have to walk. You right. don't have to to oppose any resistance on everything. Right. And uh, and so and so those are can be mitigated. Uh, like the muscle loss can be mitigated by exercise, really uh, routine exercise. The bone density is is a problem. Mm-hmm. And um, and so yes. just for for people to know, bone density is a problem. And just so that they can relate, osteoporosis. osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is something where you lose bone density yes. um, as you age, yeah. right? And you can easily fracture your vertebrae and your spine, so the bones yeah. in your spine, right? Or really any bone in your body yeah. if you have low bone density, yeah. which would obviously be a problem if you're an astronaut, if right? You're an astronaut, yeah. yes. Yeah, a bit of an issue. Um, but what about on the brain? You know, I saw that this microgravity can actually have potentially structural shifts in the brain yes yeah yeah, yeah. there is this this because uh, the brain is is floating on uh, on liquid mm-hmm. uh, as we know right the yeah. cerebral spinal fluid and so if you have a fluid shift uh, there is then pressure from different parts of the brain and so there is a shift on the brain as well that right. can uh, can affect uh, right. the, the the function yeah mm. I, I saw a study that they did uh, MRI scans for 11 astronauts after coming before and then after they came back yeah. from space um, I think some were long long term space flights some were short term space flights but nonetheless they were typical, um, just common changes that they saw, which was the brain kind of shifted upwards, right? I think the pituitary uh, shifted downwards, right? They didn't really correlate that with any sort of clinical manifestations, like you know, I don't, I don't know, like hormonal changes right. if your if your <clears throat> pituitary shifted or anything like that. But it is they did find changes that would be indicative of in, increased intracranial pressure, former increased intracranial yeah. pressure, right? So, which implies that while they were traveling in traveling, space, yes. they had 
increased intracranial pressure, yeah. so increased pressure in your brain, right? Which I think could explain maybe some of the visual acuity changes. If yes, there's a yeah, lot of yeah, pressure yeah. in your brain yeah, yeah, yeah. that can press on your optic nerve, right? Your optic nerve is yeah. what perceives sight. Is that's how you see, yeah. right? Um, and then they also know. And then a common complaint that I that I came across would be. Um, optic um, optic cup edema, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is basically when you look at the back of the eye, and if there's increased pressure on the brain, it pushes on the eye, and you yeah. can actually see it on the back of the eye. So, certainly, increased pressure in the brain is something that it's astronauts something. experience, yes. right? Yeah, but that uh, again, uh, probably you know, it's something that uh, you can uh, once they come back, uh, is solvable. Yeah, there are more uh, like those effect on the deep brain. Uh, I mean, the deep radiation on the brain that can uh, right. care, they are more you think You think that's the biggest issue? Yes, is radiation the, is, is the, the biggest issue. Is the uh, radiation to the brain yes. instead of the actual increased intracranial pressures that yes. are occurring? Yeah. Because the, the body adapts as well. The body uh, does adapt. What are some other issues um, that astronauts undergo with um, deep space travel to the brain outside of radiation? Well, there is this social isolation uh, right. yeah. and confinement, right. and we have all experienced over the past two years what it does, mm -hmm. right? Right. And That's actually, a good point. Um, very relatable right now. Very huh? relatable. Actually, the National uh, uh, Space Agency have been helping a lot uh, the medical field in the past two years because they have so much data. Wow. Uh, so they're using their their they're using their experience with yes, astronaut social yes. isolation yes, yeah, yeah, to yeah, people's yeah. experiences yes, here yeah. down on Earth during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, but that's you know, awesome, and that's very applicable to what you were saying, right? It's right. like you know the the research and our understanding of the effect of space on astronauts, right? We can use that to apply it to Earth. Yes, very and that cool. was, a, I mean, a really the COVID has been a, a really key example. Right. But NASA used constantly the, for instance, the ERA, the human analogs uh, that is, uh, and I visited that at Johnson Space Center. Is really this kind of pseudo uh, shuttle uh, where uh, humans to go in uh, like a small group for 30 days and they're completely like living as if they were in space uh, and is very well controlled. There is no absence of gravity that just to study uh, the confinement and isolation. So this is something that astronauts undergo in preparation for? The, the astronauts, but also there are many, many studies on uh, normal people that volunteer people. and they always look for volunteers in case you want to leave I'm not doing it 30 days <laughs> I'm not doing I've it. been there yeah, I've been inside go, yeah, I need to go on runs on the beach I need to do hiking I need to play with my dog yeah after I actually after I visited the the, the places where astronauts train and the, the ISS the mock facility mm -hmm. I was like hell I'm not uh, you never becoming an astronaut interest though I've been offered have you really I have the most incredible story, yes. Tell there me. is yeah, a, the, me. the uh, uh, psychologist for the astronauts that was running the Central Nervous System Health, uh, health um, Research Grants, uh -huh. uh, uh, Dr. Williams, Tom Williams, wonderful, wonderful person. So those are the astronauts will have, like, see him. Right. And, um, and we were talking, this was a few years ago, and he was like, Susanna, yes, like, you know, have you ever considered? And I'm like, what? It's like, well, why don't you apply? We <laughs> are constantly looking for someone like you. I'm like, hell no. <laughs> and then I try. I was like, I, I, I really just, I can't stay in a confined space. <laughs> if it wasn't that, would you have done it? If you didn't have to stay in training for that confined space, would you go? No. Because you would still have to stay in a confined space no. on yes. space. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely, space. I need to send me in the Amazon forest, send me in Africa, send me in the most remote place on earth, uh, but not, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. No, it's not Claustrophobia, there. probably one of the exclusionary criteria yeah. to become an astronaut. Yes, that's for sure. But also um, not seeing greens. For me, like I need to see green constantly. Look right behind you. I know. That's, that's why that's I said. Why, that's why that's I why put I you there. <laughs> Um, all right. So, well, what, what are some kind of psychological issues that astronauts undergo secondary to confined space? I mean, we can certainly relate to it, but how does some of that manifest sometimes? Well, first of all, imagine you may have family or um, in, in her, to her in her and mm -hmm. you can't communicate with them. Mm -hmm. You may have an emergency and you can't communicate to her because right. you're too far now. Right. And uh, or you are having a um, like no, you don't get along with your uh, friends right. or your colleagues, right? right? right, right. How it manifests, I think, in the normal way that all the human manifest. I mean, with anxiety probably, right. and uh, and 
um, depression, uh, anything that we have def- that we have experienced in the past two right, years. Right. What are some kind of things that maybe NASA or any other commercial space agency recommends for that? Well. They, uh, I don't know what the commercial uh, agency are doing yeah. because now they're sending everybody, right? We've seen from 18 to 90 years old, yeah. uh, uh, cancer, non-cancer. I mean, yeah. they're doing everything. So I don't know how they train those. But the astronauts are uh, really uh, highly trained, uh, you know, to endure those harsh situations, I think. So so they have kind of trained. But what are, what are some what are some tools that they're given? Are they given tools or is it just exposure to that environment in their training and if you can make it then chances are you'll make it in space are they provided any sort of like i think they, they I provide know, meditation tools probably like, you know? i don't know exactly but probably yes the best will be meditation mindfulness is the key to everything i, yeah. do, I think are you biased do you do mindfulness yourself I do try. Do you? Yes. Yeah. I think that I'm not biased. I think now we have enough uh, clinical evidence to right. show that mindfulness yeah. um, can really lower your heart rate, right. can decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. It Control your autonomic and, nervous system, yes. certainly. Anything else in regards to the effect of uh, space travel on the brain? We need to go and do it, uh, probably. We need to continue doing it? Absolutely. Continue the research. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The research and the planning for going. Yeah. The Artemis mission is yeah. coming. Right? When is it coming? Um, he was expected to be ready by 2024. Probably, I would say there is a, a little. Uh, the, the Artemis basically is the uh, colonize the moon. So mm. start to bring there uh, all the equipment for astronauts to start to learn on how to inhabit. Uh, right. And, and a, an environment that is right. not the Earth, and then exercise there for a few years, and then from there go to Mars. What it, and the Moon is beyond this, correct? Beyond the lower yes. orbit, yes. right? Yes, the so Moon is beyond s- the lower orbit. Certainly, these you issues have, that we're talking about yes. are going to be present for these astronauts yes. very shortly, very soon coming on the Moon. Yes. Yeah. The difference is that to get to the Moon, it will take only a few days. Right. And uh, and. You know, compared to Mars, right. but it's an incredible exercise uh, for the uh, astronauts right, right. to learn to inhabit an, an environment that is hostile, right? An hostile right. environment, and then maybe not as much social isolation, and then potentially some of the research that we're able to do there before we go yes. deeper into space, yes. right? Interplanetary exploration, yes, and yeah. probably Mars. To be true, to be honest, Mars will not be the planet that will. Uh, 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 I mean, it will be the one that uh, we want to explore. It won't be the one that uh, will be inhabited. Which inhabit, one? Since you're saying, inhabit, since you're inhabit. since you're saying it's not the one that we're going to inhabit, then you got to have one on your mind that we are going know. to inhabit. Are I you just know. saying Mars ain't it? Let's keep looking. I think I would keep looking. It. Really? Yeah. We haven't identified like a Goldilocks planet that potentially we would be able to colonize. Well, first we let's go to Mars because let's it's the closest Mars. one. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I do tend to get ahead of myself. I'm sorry. But, you know, even Mars, uh, most likely because there is no protection from the radiation, they would have to live underground if they go there, right? And so is that a plane or a planet that want to be in habit underground? Right. I don't know. Maybe. Is that? But we're not going to do that on the moon, are we? Probably they will. I don't know. I don't know if they try to go to the moon. What's they will the, start to breed. They will try to build a, a, uh, some sort of structure. A structure there, yeah. But there's no structure that they can build right now that's gonna uh, shield them from this radiation Correct. that you've had. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And then you know, I was also wondering about some of the effects that astronauts experience when they come back. So there is an immediate uh, problem, which also is another problem that needs to be uh, faced: is uh, their re-entry to Earth because right. they they pass from. Uh, no gravity to gravity, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, their body, the adaptation of the body, it's um, it's compromised. But you know, when they get when they come back, they are somewhere in Kazakhstan or whatever. When they, and 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 there is always someone to care right. for them. Right. But once they land in Mars, there is nobody to take care of them. And so that's actually one one key aspect that I also study is alone, like you know, the entry in the planet, the landing. Right. Um, and um, and so so yes, when they come back, uh, when they come back, they have this initial uh, like uh, you know they get re- like kind of sick for a couple of days, right? Mm-hmm. Then, but they are all taken care of. Yeah. But then it's the long term that we don't uh, we don't know much. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Go. 
I you know one thing that I've always wondered is, is some of the g forces that they yes. that these astronauts sustain yeah. both on takeoff yes, right and, and then back. on reentry into the yeah. into earth um you know what are those g forces doing to the brain you know I w- one of the first episodes that we did, I did it with Aaliyah Snyder. She was a winter Olympian, um, like a bobsledder, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she's going around these yeah. turns, going very, very fast, right? And then this thing is coming out, uh, has come out recently that these players are sp- are sustaining these sort of accumulative concussive injuries, injuries to the brain, secondary to them having to sustain that much G force for that extended period of time, repetitively yeah. over and over and over again. So that leads me to wonder what are some kind of things that might be happening to the brain upon takeoff and upon reentry? That's a great question. I actually have discussed extensively with uh, uh, some headquarters at NASA as well. How do we study that, right? Mm. Because perhaps we are trying to study the absence of gravity throughout the, right. the trip. And maybe it's not a big deal. We don't think it maybe is a big deal. But the big deal is really this re-entry into, into Earth and how to study. There has been uh, some experiments like with like putting the, the mice in a centrifuges or uh-huh. like, you know, a spinning. Yeah. And uh, and there is not the ideal model yet uh, to for how to study or what it does really to the brain. Right. Are you able to walk me through, I don't know if you know the technicalities of what re-entry into Earth looks like for an astronaut? Oh, now you're asking me. I don't know that I'm prepared. Like to, from, to from a G perspective, right? Like yes. it's, it's certainly not comfortable. No. Right? Um, they're re-entering into space at speeds above, I don't even know, like <laughs> fi- hun- hundreds or thousands of miles an hour. Yeah. Right? It's very fast. And, you know, just comparing it to this Winter Olympian, you know, they're going 70 miles an hour down yeah. that thing, right? And then when you relate that to reentry, certainly that can be a lot, you know, way, yeah. way more significant, right? That is. And, and again, that is significant. That, and... Uh, but 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 in the hurt there is someone to care for for them right once right, they right, once right, they right. land right, right, right exactly the landing into Mars is yeah. is a major concern yeah. do they do they knock are they knocked out right. and then nobody is like you know there to to help right. them we don't know much exactly and then the people that are there to help them have undergone irradiation to the brain for the last yes. what like year <laughs> so that's who you're relying to to take care of you so yes. I mean like there looks like there seems to be a lot of different concerns in regards to brain injury, secondary to radiation, as well as a lot of different things in space travel. There are. And I don't know that they're going to be solved by the time that we will be ready to go to Mars. So you think that this isn't a limiting factor for space travel? Is the potential for this? It's like, hey, it's happening. Yes. Do your best to figure out how to to optimize. Yes. I mean, imagine you and I, we go out and we tell, uh, you know, Forget about going to Mars. Let's Elon Musk, there. chill out, Mira. Chill out, He Elon. doesn't even, uh, he's not even concerned about the brain. He right. just wants to go there faster. Right, yeah. Did, didn't he say he wants to die in Mars? Maybe he is smart enough. He understood that he could I think come. he said he would die in Mars. He if would, he could uh, die anywhere, he would die on Mars. Right. And then he didn't understand why that was weird. But um, I mean, if he buys Twitter, maybe he has enough money. Yeah, I think he's bought Twitter already now. No. no. I mean, as of this morning on NPR, it was... Did oh, really? Sign up? It was still He's still pending? thinking. Uh, yeah. It is what it is. He's having a second thought. Can you use Twitter in, on the International Space Station? Can you tweet from the ISS? Yes. You can? Yeah. You have Wi-Fi in the ISS? Yeah, the astronauts tweet it from there, right? Do they? I think they send pictures, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if they have access. Like, do they have oh. access to Twitter? Or do they send it to someone that then tweets for, for them? The ISS is, is really, I mean, do you know how far is the ISS? How far is it? Yeah. I don't you know. know. No. How, Guess. How, how, I mean, this space stuff, it's like, it always blows my mind how, how far things are away. What? You can. You can tweet from the ISS? Yeah. Really? Yeah. As of, huh. yeah, since 2010. I wow. mean, uh, you know how far it is. How far is, is it? Around, is around 200 kilometers. 200 kilometers? Yeah. Uh, to, to, uh, wait, 400 kilometers, around uh, 250 miles away. Oh, man. It's not that far. That the is ISS not, is not that far. Is that considered space travel? It is considered low orbit. Uh, really? Low orbit Earth. So, That's interesting. <laughs> no, don't, let's not underestimate all those at the coast. Yeah, ISS. no, I mean, it's still an incredible <laughs> but, feat to but, get to the ISS. Right, the ISS, I mean, but, you can tweet, you, can, you have constant right, communication right, right, with right, Earth. Right. And so it's, it's certainly you're lacking that aspect of really being 
far and far from right. Earth. But that's, I mean, that's important when it comes to the social isolation exactly. thing, right? Exactly. If you're like, if you're tweeting from the ISS, yeah. like, come on, you're not that <laughs> unplugged, right? You don't tweet from the era or those mock facility like you know. So the NASA studies on social isolation they are done on the era, the human uh, um, space analog, and that is uh, it, uh, uh, in Texas, and then uh, and. Uh, uh, from those that goes uh, to Antarctica, you know all the studies that they, right. they, they they stay up there. I have also a friend that does all those. They mission. do they do studies in Antarctica or, do, or they do training in Antarctica. They do studies from a scientist that goes to Antarctica to study there the ice, but they're they are isolated for six months of the year. So oh, they wow. do the two things: they study, but they serve also as a control. Have you seen that story about? that uh, I think it was a Russian physician that was on an uh, expedition to Antarctica. He was a surgeon, uh-huh. right? And this is like back in, I don't know, the 40s. Never don't Cry Wolf. Don't quote me. What is that? The movie. I've never seen it. But let me finish this because it's incredible. It. And we'll put a picture up of this guy. But he went to Antarctica and he got appendicitis when he was like by himself with like a couple of other people yeah. in Antarctica, yeah. right? And he's the surgeon, right? So if anyone gets appendicitis, this is the guy to do the surgery right, right, to fix right, it, right. right? So he ends up doing the surgery on himself. And there's a picture out there of it. And it's yes. incredible. He's like, you know, dozing off because he gave, gave himself a little bit of sedation, but not too much so that he could stay awake during the procedure. Actually did it and survived. So I'm sure you would do it. I'm um, not a surgeon, but... You know, if I, I think if I had to, I probably would just do See, it. See, you're trained. You have the training. I do have some training, more than the general population, but, you know, not as much as a surgeon. Well, you so. put people on a stream situation and they yeah. grieve. They, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know who uh, Mayank Mehta is? I've mentioned him <clears throat> the last two episodes, so I'm a big fan of him. Dr. Mayank Mehta is the director of the Neurophysics Lab. Mm-hmm. He's looking at um, the effect of virtual reality mm-hmm. to be able to test for dementia, yes. A, yeah. and then B, um, the beneficial effects on neuroplasticity yes. and uh, learning in virtual reality yeah. versus the actual real world. Well, actually, the virtual reality, uh, it's also another uh, thing that is uh, uh, it's contemplated for the astronauts as well, right? Is if it? they can use virtual reality to train their brain while they're in space. While, oh, while they're in space. Yeah, yeah. And, and also psychologically, right? You probably, I mean, I would miss, the thing that I would miss is to, to walk on a forest, oh, to a go point. for a hike, right? And point. so you can put that on virtual reality and probably your brain will, be, your brain will benefit as we know that it's calming, right? Nature. Wow. And then, so, honestly, if you're if you're looking to test for cognitive deficits yes, in space, yes. right? Especially in a context, it's like we need to know if you're declining cognitively yes. or not, yeah. right? Um, using virtual reality, which potentially could increase uh, the ability to detect any mild deviation yes, in your cognition, exactly. would be really beneficial. Yeah, and right? you are your own. Uh, you will serve as your own control because you right. start right, right, and right. then you, you keep doing. And then you keep yes, doing that's it. how they do. It. Yes, right. yeah. Yeah. So I'll put you in touch. Yeah. With Dr. Meta, I'm sure you could just reach out to him. But yeah. Anyways, are, are you doing any research yourself that you'd like to discuss and promote a little bit? And or are you doing anything, any projects or anything like that? Well, now we are. So we have worked for a long time on the st- studying the effect of only radiation to the brain. Right. Mm-hmm. And now we are uh, analyzing the effect of those different stressors that we have discussed to see if they worse than a the brain function or is the same. And so different stressors are social isolation in mice Mm -hmm. uh, and absence of gravity Mm -hmm. combine uh, either alone or combine with radiation. Okay. So basically really mimicking what we we have discussed so far. Right, like does people's cognition, what does people, are you going to specifically look at cognition or are you going to look at other? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds like you'll be looking at cognitive performance with social with social isolation yes. versus you know with social isolation plus irradiation Correct. and what is actually the what some of the main contributors yes. to uh, these cognitive deficits. Yeah, and actually compare that to the radiation alone. Uh, is there better? And comparing or the, to the or radiation alone. Yes, that right. we have studied so far. And then the next step will be to create, to start to build, uh, the, which actually we started those machine machine learning uh, program to really feed in all those data from the mice right. and build predictive models that we can say, okay, if a mouse is uh, performing in a certain way in a task, is this predictive of long, long-term deficits? Got it. And then I want to add to that uh, the astronauts possibly. Right. So what is your hypothesis for that? 
what's your hypothesis for social isolation versus irradiation versus just social isolation versus just irradiation? What's going to be worse for uh, the mice's cognitive performance? Well, so far what we have seen is that the driving force is still radiation. Yeah, that makes sense. That is the driving force. Yeah, so that's what you expect. Really, yeah. So the UCLA Space Medicine Fellowship just launched. That's wonderful. Which is extremely cool. Um, and I think there's one other space medicine fellowship with the goal of training physicians to be able to be like space physicians, yes. right? Yes, like what do you, Ser- what Serena do you think Onion about that? Chancellor. What's that? Like Serena, the, the astronaut, right, Serena. Right, right. Okay. Serena Agnon, I, I never pronounce her last name. Yeah. She is a, a trained physician for, yeah. for space. That's where she performs medicine as well. Right. Uh, that's essential. That's essential. You can't uh, you can't rely on uh, on telemedicine once the astronauts are on space. I mean, you need a trained physician to be there. So right now, sometimes astronauts will go into space without a physician, and their physician will be over the computer yes. via telemedicine. Yes, telemedicine from Earth. But usually, in the ISS, they always have a doctor there. There's a doctor always present on the ISS. Y- yes. Okay. There has always to be, but we need more trained precisely to do uh, medicine in space, which is completely different. Completely I mean, when I went yeah. uh, to visit uh, the ISS uh, mock uh, facility, it's a different uh, ballpark. Right. Just imagine uh, when you try to get blood and you have you have no gravity right, and everything right. flies, right? Really catch the blood. So you... it's a different training. So yeah. that's so exciting. Yeah. Are you going to apply to that? I don't know. All right. Well. Can you give me a letter of recommendation I to will. NASA? All right, NASA, I'm coming for you guys. Um, Though no, I have to disclaim, I I was asked for, by four people to apply for astronauts last year, European uh, Space and uh, a NASA, to write them a letter. Oh, really? Yeah, but nobody called, uh, so oh, okay. maybe it's a bad luck. I don't maybe. know. Maybe. But I'll try. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important what we're doing. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Um, um, yes. Yeah. Do you believe in aliens? <laughs> <laughs> you are a neuroscientist. It probably has nothing to do with it. But if I have any opportunity to talk about aliens, I will. Do you believe in them? Um, I don't. You don't? <clears throat> you think? Well, wait. There are two, two, two parts of this question. Okay. One is, do you believe on the green uh, little alien that came to Earth? That's a good point. And I don't. You don't. Okay. The other is, do you believe that there are other forms of life in other planets? Mm-hmm. And that I do. Okay. But you don't believe that they're, coming you know, here. The, the prototypical sort of aliens no. that are coming no. and they've never visited here no. or anything like that. I yeah. don't. I, yeah, I think I'm up that alley too. Where <laughs> There's got to be a Goldilocks planet. There yes. has to be a Goldilocks planet, yeah. right, where... There's some sort of form, form of life there. Some amoeba, some, some amoeba, bacteria. Yeah, yeah. But we, we were amoebas at some exactly, point. Exactly, so exactly. It makes sense. Yeah, but you know, you, we can't. So I would never exclude uh, that there is other form of life right. in the entire universe. Right. Actually, it would be very unique that we are the only one. But yeah. then we enter into philosophy and religion. So. That's another podcast <laughs> episode, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> anything else that you want to share? before we wrap up. Thank you. This is so much fun. I love talking about yeah, science and yeah, space. Me and too. So yeah, inspiring. thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I've been dying to have you. I know it's been there's been some rescheduling, so yeah, thank you for accommodating. True. But um, this is a really, really exciting, exciting topic. I think more research needs to be invested. I think more funding needs to be invested Absolutely. into this research, right? And I think the reasons for that are because we are going – like you said, we space travel is happening. Yes. Long-term space travel yes. is happening, yes. right? If we want to get the most out of it and keep the, our astronauts safe, we need to figure out how yes. to do that. Because you're saying right now, we don't have any shelter for these people. Yeah, we, we don't, don't have, the, like the spacesuits <laughs> that they wear now are not protecting. They will, become, they'll, they will be irradiated over an 18-month uh, travel trip. To and from three, Mars. Three years. Three years, 18 sorry. months is to get to Mars. Right, right, right. But then back. <laughs> and then right, back. Exactly. Yeah, so three years, mission. right? So what is going to happen to yes. these people from yeah. just constant exposure, yeah. right? Uh, I can only imagine. And then also it's going to, you know, everyone's going to start space traveling. Yes, right? I mean, we've seen so, now. Yes. Yeah, and so. I try on to tweet on Twitter to to ping uh, Elon Musk and say, right. just the brain, invest on the brain, right, uh, you right, know? Right, Elon Musk, invest please. on the brain, please. <laughs> <laughs> for right. humanity. Yeah, absolutely. Anyways, thank you so much for coming on. Thank I'm you. sure I'll find another reason to have you on because you're doing so much cool stuff. Absolutely. Uh, but space medicine was the first topic. Maybe TBI and CBD will come later. 
Okay. All right. Thank All right. You thank so you, much. everyone. Um, my name is Adele. This is the UCLA Brain Sport Podcast. Dr. Susana Rossi, thank you so much for joining. Um, we have an email at the bottom. If you guys have any questions, any recommendations, on maybe some topics to be able to cover later, please let us know. If you'd like to be placed in touch with Dr. Susana Rossi, you can email the email in the video description. And if it's okay with you, yes. I will put you in touch. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. And bye-bye. <laughs>